So, uh, typically by the end of the day, our brains hurt. We want to walk up early and uh, some people drop out because they can't handle it. So, you guys who stayed here still have some brains. The rest are trying to rest it. Uh, so, I typically what we do at the end of the day is just open it up for the floor completely. Uh, we'll start with a bit of insights from the mentors to see what they heard today and uh, how they saw the ecosystem also evolving. But we then keep it completely open. So we share insights, stories from what we heard, advice from, from tables we, we learned about. And by the way, uh, we didn't mention the beginning of the day, but we follow up with an email. We're, uh, we're doing with Google for entrepreneurs, uh, at the end of the year, we pick one of the teams from a mix and mentor to fly to Silicon Valley to do a program that is uh, worked on by Google. So the way we would pick the winners, we would pick the ones who would go, is for the startups to create a video on the tips they heard from mentors and how they applied it. Basically, we want to encourage entrepreneurs to share tips they're getting and how they were able to, to implement them. So in a week, you'll get an email uh, as entrepreneurs, and, uh, and again, it's, it's a program with Google for Entrepreneurs that's being done in, in, in Smith and the Valley. Uh, so I'll start with Sohra. Sohra, you, you came here last year and the year before at the Mix and Mentor Amman. First of all, I just want to get your thoughts on the evolution of the ecosystem, how are you seeing it evolve, um, what, what are the challenges that are evolving, the, the opportunities you are seeing to evolve, and maybe tips, commonalities that you just want to, from, from the, 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 the entrepreneurs that you talk to, if there are any tips and advice you want to make it generic. Um, so it's always good to be back in Oman. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I guess one of the first things uh, was um, I knew more people than I did last year. Um, and I guess that's a, a good sign because it means people are surviving. Um, so well done for surviving. Um, I think uh, the first year we came out here, obviously everybody was new. And, uh, and it was all about, well, I'm thinking about doing this or we're just starting this. Uh, this year, very much, I you know, spent some time with businesses that were very well established. One business I spoke to, you know, uh, six or seven years. Um, the other business, you know, two years. So I felt that uh, the biggest change was there seemed to be some uh, uh, some lifetime in a lot of the people I spoke to. Um, I was very impressed to see numbers that were sort of in the millions. Um, so that's always great to see. So well done for that, and that's fantastic traction. Um, so I felt from an ecosystem evolution point of view, um, we've, we've gone way past the stage of people coming to this event with sort of business ideas and, um, you know, hey, what do you think I'll come up against to, you know, what I saw today, which was, hey, look, you know, we have leading users and I'm trying to convert more of them into paying buyers. Um, so that's fantastic and well done for all of you for being a part of that. Um, some of the, the takeaways, uh, some of the mentors were, you know, we did ask in our e-commerce session, you know, did you pick up anything that you're going to go back and implement? And I was very happy that these people said yes. You know, there were things that we picked up at this event that we're going to try and incorporate as soon as we get back. And I think, you know, ultimately that's a big part of what we're trying to do here. Um, so that was impressive to see. And I think the, the format, um, you know, really that, that uh, worked very well. Uh, the sessions upstairs were, you know, I felt really, really good. Um, we got to uh, spend some quality time and do a deep dive. Um, it was far more personal, and I felt that you know I was able to offer a lot more value, and I hope that the mentors felt that you know, they received more value. So those are my key takeaways. Okay, cool. Hervé, uh, uh, also, I mean, you're based in Beirut, and you, your dwelling is, is regional. Um, some of the things that you, as an entrepreneur, has, have passed through as Diwani to take you to the level you are today, to an exit, to, to even more growth. Some of the challenges that you saw entrepreneurs that you came to have, that you were able to quickly pinpoint, that everyone else in the room can also benefit from. I guess it's... Um, so, so, that was my first time, in, uh, not as a tourist in Amman. So, I found a lot of similarity with what we found in Beirut. So there is a good pool of talent, some brain drain as well. Um, so you can produce a lot of things right there that we all rely on the GCC market to monetize. And so having that, um, 
this connection between where you produce and, and, and where you monetize create a, a more uh, complex uh, uh, infrastructure to monetize, or, or this connection, it's, it's a lot of cost. And, and one of the secrets of the only secret uh, was to be able to get both offices at the same time. So we have, we have 20 people in the room, but we have also 20 people in Dubai. We're doing the monetization all day long. So, so for, for those who are trying to monetize a state through a sway or through a. What, let me get a. What do you. I mean, not let me get a. What do you. What do you suggest? I mean, you have. You start from the beginning, you want two offices. Yeah. You want to do your own sales. Look, it's. it's, it's I can lead you to the discussion we had with, uh, with the telco and monetizing through the telco. Is, um, that's what I said. There is a, a, we are in a scale business. People who don't understand that if you are talking to millions, you will never do money. No matter what kind of content things you do online. So, uh, and even when you are in millions, uh, your margin are not that high. So, I'm, I'm a bit simple guy. Uh, a more farmer approach. When I don't understand, I don't do. When I start to go into Dubai, having people telling me, oh, you need to give that to the agencies, and then you need to give 40% to your major. And I was doing the things, so I was like, the guy is going to need my product, and I won't be able to make money. So that's why we decided from day one that if there was one chance to succeed, is to monetize ourselves. The downside of it was, we're going to lose a lot of money to start with. So we need to convince people to back us up. And to be fair, Diwali was a great company. Uh, we have done a good product, but I think where we succeed more better than the competitor was the ability to raise a lot of cash. So when my competitor was raising $2 million around three years, we have run six, eleven now with a few rounds. So that gave us the ability to do it. Um, so how many clients have you done last year? I mean, as an example of how much you have to face your face to draft this whole time. Yeah, 110. 110 clients. Yeah. So, and I guess I'm going to need this this year. And, and the reason for, for that is because you want to sell your own product, your own, your own publications, and you, no one better than you understands how to sell that, or no one better than the team that is closer to developing or what? Because I think you, you always, when you build a product, you're the best to talk about it. So when someone is distributing your product, we, we don't do boxes in the sense of we're not selling cereals in the supermarket and so on. So uh, the, the product is intangible. And uh, again, back in the discussion, there is there's a lot of people who are claiming to have to move the audience. So when you go to an advertiser, you're like, oh, I have five million uh, women putting a month on my photo. I guess you can find a dozen of other people who can say exactly the same things. So the way you're going to talk about it is the first thing that will make a difference. The second thing is, the more you're in contact with the clients, the advertiser, the more you're going to be able to shape your product to serve their needs. So when I talk to an advertiser, I'm like, but you know, I can modify my product to fit your needs. When you have someone selling your product, you have that disconnection between the content creator and the one who sells it. And that disconnection means you cannot produce something unique, you're going to produce something average. The minute you produce something average, you need a much bigger scale than the one who is unique. So today we have media rep, you name some they are doing a good job, but they take a big chunk of the money out of the table. They go on the market and I think have 80 million, 80 million uniques in the region, and they sell by the mass. Us we go in our style, we have the ability to reach 70,000 women in Kuwait that are going full time a month into the beauty category of my website. And we're going to be able to talk about your brands and talk about your product and drive them to school. That's a different self speech. But only you can do that because you know you can deliver. So, and, uh, okay. uh, yeah. uh, because I was on the same uh, table and I like uh, the way you described the value chain of, uh, <laughs> of, of the content uh, play and how like a very small percentage of 25% is actually about content and the rest is distribution and sales and how you do it the other way around, how you start from or you validate with sales. So I think it's a very nice th uh, thing to share with everybody. Yeah, it's, it's um, so, so just to give you the numbers, because everybody is saying that 
Diwali is a content company and I will do some great content and blah blah blah, etc. And so I gave some number to say, what is a content company in the digital space? Um, we are 140 people. Only 25% of that company is producing actual content. The other 75% of the company is, is working on distributing that content and selling that content. And so when we produce something, we make sure we are able to distribute it and showing it to a lot of people, and we're going to be able to sell it. If there is no green light on distribution and, and sell, there is no green light for production. So most of the time when I discuss with other companies in content, they think their business is to produce content. But when you are in content, your business is to produce, distribute, and monetize content. If you forget the two last part, you're working there. And, and that's blend truth. And the other thing we were discussing is never forget that the, the, the platform that's going to help you distribute your content doesn't understand the content. Google doesn't understand what they put on top of a page or what of the bottom of the page. They realize, they, they rely on other people, so backlinks, uh, clicks on the search result page, a lot of, there's 200 criteria into the algorithm. But if there is 200 criteria in the algorithm, it's for a reason. They don't, they don't understand what they are they're calling. So they rely on the other criteria. So if they can play well with those criteria, you get more eyeballs than someone else. Same on Facebook. They rely on other people's reaction to decide to put on the timeline or not. Everybody's we think we understand well that algorithm, at least we react quickly, so we know how to distribute the good and fix the challenge as well. So we live in a very tech world, content in a tech world, meaning you need to be super strong in tech. If you're not super strong in tech, you're not a content creator in a tech world. Look, distribution magazine is very different, TV distribution is very different. And the last part you will mention is so any piece of content came up in the lineup for the sales. So the sales know approximately two months in advance what we're going to produce. So they can talk to brands and tell brands you have the opportunity, opportunity to be in the content, not around the content. Uh, one last question to you. What's your advice for a startup who's bootstrapping in content and want to get that feedback loop from brands? So the feedback loop from brands is expensive. You need to be in Dubai, you have to go to the brand, you have to get access to the brand, you have to show face, and meanwhile you have to have your content production house up and running. For a company who's early in the state and hasn't had the chance to fundraise yet a big amount, what's your advice for being you know, feedback loop? Trying to... Because I even try... At some point, you need to have some luck. The breakthrough for the money was L'Oreal uh, Group. We had luck. I ended up with the MD of L'Oreal in the region. Uh, I hooked him on something. Basically, at that time, I was, it, it, wasn't worth, it was nothing bad. So when we started with L'Oreal in 2010, that was the first big advertiser we had in direct. Uh, I told him there is 1.2 million times women typing beauty related search in Google from Saudi Arabia. And if you look at the, uh, the, the result page, there were no brands, no content from brands. And I was like, there is 1.2 million times women looking for your product and you're not there. And they look at me and say, I never look at Google like this. I was like, let's build the content together and put you in front of it. And that was the breakthrough for us. So the advice would be based on this. Try to find the right CMO, the right person that can, that uh, that is eager enough to innovate, that won't make a rational decision in the sense of the rational decision is I'm going to do something that's going to reach millions. You need to break this when you start. You need to find someone that I like those guys and I want to try something with them, and then your job to deliver well and get another one, and get another one, and another one. But the breakthrough for us was L'Oreal. And that pitch on, there's just four of us, this 
talking nonsense about skincare, and we can make much better content on the about that. On a move to e-commerce uh, and, uh, and with Amal, uh, I'm going to ask you about, about first what, we, what you saw from the ecosystem evolution in, in Jordan and some of the trends, I mean, if you can share with us some of the trends that you see coming through your, your gateway effectively and where you think you're the, the trends are going to go in the next few years. If there's any particular sectors that you see are going, are going to be very hot that you advise people to look, to look for. Well, I think if you're looking at the, the ecosystem in, uh, in, in Jordan, every, every Jordanian entrepreneur actually never thinks about serving the Jordanian market. They're always thinking about serving everywhere else. So uh, my question to everybody is that why do you want to serve the Jordanian market? There are consumers here, right? So it's, I think it's a good place to start. So if you feel like I don't want to serve the Jordanian market, it's so small, it's very small, it's very small, I mean, it makes starting a company twice as hard. Because you need, like you said, you need to travel and come back and get visas and talk to people and so forth. So if you have a successful model, I think it would work locally first, and then you can start talking about expanding into other markets. If you feel like it's not going to work in Jordan, then you pack up your bag and you go to that place where you want to start up a business. I think from, from that's my my initial uh, uh, you know, observation. I think there's a lot of great ideas. The question is how you you, know, you scale them. But again, you start somewhere, and then you, when you have the KPIs to show to investors that I can, I can produce this elsewhere, I can develop this elsewhere, then uh, it's good. Uh, Jordan is a big the tourism destination, but I haven't seen any uh, you know, um, startups around tourism in, in, uh, in Jordan. So that's, that's another thing. When we came in yesterday, I come to Jordan maybe once, or, once every month or maybe once every two months. We have a, our technical team here. We have a lot of first technical knowledge in, uh, in Jordan. And I can tell you that this time I was like shocked at the airport. It was packed of tourists. So how are these? I think there's one company here trying to do something to Air, Airbnb. But what, what was the number you mentioned to me yesterday at, at dinner about uh, the, the market size for, for travel? Payment online and hotel? In the, in the region? Yeah. So the total market uh, travel uh, for the region is 350 billion overall. 50 billion of it is, is actually transacting online. So 50 billion dollars every year are transacting online in the region. And it's growing by 15%. Around travel and growing by 15% year on year. And the, and e commerce, physical e commerce? Uh, physical, it depends on the market or it depends on the e commerce site. But overall, I think. Year over year, no, I mean like the, the market size. The market size, I think last year was around nine billion dollars. Uh, this year, uh, we have to wait until the end of the year to see what happens. But a lot of the what we're seeing is that the, you know people define e-commerce differently. It's, I define e-commerce as a physical good. Anything that's digital, for me, it's, it's something else. So, but that shares with us sometimes because under your gateway again passes. Lots of transactions, you see the trends, what's working, what's not working, what's shutting down, what started last year and shut down, what started last year and is doing, you know, obviously a lot of it is confidential, but on the aggregate, what excites you and what scares you? Like if you get a client that pay for that does X, great, you're going to be a huge client in a few years. If you get a client that pay for that does Y, you're going to say no, you're going to die next year, so not a great client. Okay. So what excites us, and you mentioned that this morning, is that we work with a lot of startups. So we get very excited when we invest time in... Well, what trend, what, what sectors are you talking they're, they're across the board. I think there's so many issues in the Arab world and, and I think young entrepreneurs are taking it by the horn. So one guy wants to solve the transportation problem in Egypt, the other one wants to solve how to buy a, a, you know, a ticket and so forth. So we're, we're seeing more verticals. So it's not just the travel and e-commerce. We're excited because we're seeing other verticals that are contributing to that big pie chart. I want to ask you that, Dr. Sahab, as well, actually, the verticals. So when you talk e-commerce niche, so you know, the early e-commerce plays in the region were very wide. Souk is a, a, a big example of that. And to a certain extent, Marta VIP and Nemshi in fashion. But, but when you talk much, much more niche, selling football clothing online, or selling you know, whatever, something that's very niche, from you, again, from the traffic that you see under your gateway, is that a viable, Product or is it too small for the region today? 
if a company comes around that going, you know, picking one niche, is that viable or is that too small? In the e-commerce uh, roundtable, so Rob mentioned the evolution of the e-commerce uh, ecosystem. That first people migrate to the internet, and they're driven by value. Then they'll be driven by choice, and then after that, they'll be driven by convenience. So all the startups that are focusing on um, niche, uh, uh, you know, uh, verticals or niche products, instead of selling, you know, uh, you know consumer electronics, they're selling, you know, uh, pop art, for example. These are the ones that are filling the, the long term. They, these are the ones that you find their product. You won't find it offline, but you'll find it online. So a lot of people are driven by value. So. Uh, 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 Visa and, and MIRG did a report in 2013. They found that around 30% of people shop worldwide, shop online because they find a niche product that they don't find offline, or if it's it's available offline, but it's really far. It's not it's, a, it's not in my vicinity. So, and I think with increased supply, you know, you'll find more transactions because if I want to shop online and I know there's 400 SKUs of laptops in the market, and I want to go online and only find 50. So I'm not going to make a decision to buy a laptop. I'll go first to the jungle electronics of the world and all these shopping centers first, and then I'll make my personal decision because I'm afraid as a consumer to make that decision. I so came up with the idea that, that uh, the uh, first entrants into e-commerce tend to be, you know, you know, price-driven players, and I think we did see that here in the region. Certainly, you know, going at it, um, you know, deal-based sites. I think uh, Souk, um, huge success with Deep Day, uh, markedly IPO, you know, fast sales. So uh, the consumer was drawn in uh, through a price proposition. And I think that the next stage of evolution is now starting to give the consumer choice and to say that, well, being an online business, we can have you know, two, three hundred thousand SKUs, which a, a traditional retailer can't do. I think that. Um, you know, as the market matures, you start to look at business models where the customer proposition tends to be a bit more sophisticated. It's not just price. So, what kind of first? Tell me a bit about what you saw today, and from what you saw, the whole mix. Try to come up with some of the tips that, or some of the things you want to see in a startup before it gets ready for the investment side that you look at you guys look at. The metrics, the team, the runway, the, the, you know, the growth. Could be across a few seconds or could be across the seconds that you're most most in the I think before starting with the investments, the one thing I can tell you one thing I'm seeing right now is a lot of tired eyes. A lot of tired people. So I'm gonna do something that I tend to do in these kind of uh, forum. And so I just get up. Get up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say the, the two things. I'll try to make it short and snappy so as to keep the energy, the little energy that we still have. Uh, um, the two things that I saw that were really interesting is a lot of clarity in terms of what people are trying to address, either a problem or a specific opportunity. And the other one was passion, especially one guy where I said, look, um, I know no, no offense to e-commerce, but we, we have a little bit of animosity to some e-commerce models just because of what you said, the scale, the cash, the capex that it requires to actually grow. And the guy said, no, you're wrong. And because of this and this and that, and because here's a, where I see this specific niche, we're talking about different niches, this is where I see this niche going in the next three to four years. And it's backed up by this data and this observation that I've seen in this market, boom, boom, boom. Okay, good, you know, you have a set of data. And that's the other piece which I saw was a little bit of a weakness. We're sitting down with some of the entrepreneurs upstairs Yes, they understood what they were trying to solve, what they were trying to achieve, but in terms of defining the market and what they're targeting, who they're targeting, really understanding the customer base, that was really the, the, the biggest weakness, I say. And from the investor, yeah, but not only they data, but understanding the market. I think, uh, Omar, you mentioned it, you know, people here, this is not my observation, your observation, 
that they see Jordan and then immediately they want to go and look at other markets. <coughs> Why do you want to look at other markets? Have you really understood the other markets? Have you really done your market research? You know, I know it's back to basics, but at the end of the day, if you're going to attract investable dollars, that's where you have to go back, back to basics, and have that set of data. So do a good diligence on your own before anybody comes and asks it from you. So what is that diligence? What would you want to see? What is that data? Well, we, we had our uh, VC session afterwards, and Omar mentioned it. You know, well, you know, how, if you've been up and running for the past two, three years, do you have all your financial data? Do you have, how do you report? Uh, reporting is not so much about knowing your own numbers, but as I said it during the panel, it's also a communication tool. Think about it, you're inviting people from outside, right? external stakeholders. How do you communicate with them? Well, data, financial numbers, that's is a way to communicate. That's close, but that's once you invest. I'm saying pre-investment, what do what, what you want to see? I think that excites you. Yeah. It's, it's also pre-investment, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Just to add up on this, each one we have made, uh, we had a very, very good financial team. We had a very good financial team, and, and you can tell the, the look of the VCs when they arrive, that they see the PNS, and the sheet, everything by down. They ask for a document, the contract has come, always the same place. You don't throw in the wrong place, as much as you know that contract. And they look at you as that. It's a marketing tool in, in, in some way for startups. So you know what? We might be working uh, uh, 16 hours a day, but still the house is in, in the right order, and we know where we're going. It is a plan. We, we both know that we accept friendship on middle trees, but I'm going to show you that I know my drivers, and, and, and what if the ship in the van, or most probably one ship in the van, I know how, how I'm going to react. So tips on, on how to, as a startup who's working 16 hours a day, how can you get, how can you keep your shit together, your financial shit together? Don't, don't underestimate. Hire uh, the accountant, hire... Yeah, it, 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 it's part of the job. It's, you know when we saw it, the guys were coming from Europe, first investment in the Middle East, I continued, they, they were expecting this. And they arrived and they had the data room, when we see what's going on. They had things I never thought they were going to ask. They asked for the board minutes of three past years to see how the company was run and the construct. And everything was in place. So I guess it, it played some role in myself. I'm talking to entrepreneurs that are designing their company to grow and not just running with the business. Absolutely. I mean, there's one thing I want to just mention. If you think about a company, do you, does, do people know where the term comes from? What's the etymology of the word company? It's Latin, companies, right? To share the bread. So if you're sharing the bread, you have to be able to be transparent. The more transparent you are, the better you are at communicating with your stakeholders. And what that is, it makes perfect sense. When you, you're going to, you know, you're going to have bad news. The, you know, what the real was saying about the shit getting the fan. Well, it's about communicating and how you, that, how you maintain the dialogue even through the bad times. I mean, VC investors or any type of investor, they know they're going to be failures, they're going to be bad times. It's just how you manage those crises, which is important. And if you have a good set of reporting tools, whether it's reporting or you know, anything that allows you to talk about the business in a knowledgeable fashion, it's so much easier to manage that crisis. Yeah, I hear lots of people saying, you don't need a business plan to start a business. You, know, you can just go ahead and start a business. You know what? I've started six businesses. I don't know how to start a business without a data spreadsheet. I just don't know how to do it. And you know, I think it's just you know basic you know questions that you should be asking. You know, so they said about what the hell are the drivers? You know, what happens if this assumption is you know is wrong by this amount? What's the impact of that? So you know, fundamentally, you have to have a view on you know what are your key metrics and you know what do they need to be? How do they sort of relate to each other? If you don't know that. You, you really should. Um, you know, don't go any further into the system. I, I literally, you know, sorry, there's this, I just went through this process. We just hit two years. And as a business in the Gulf, like two years is a very big benchmark because it uh, unlocks bank loans and actually like normal things in most other parts of the world. But it's a pretty big step. And we just went through our full audit. And we're very similar with business development facing kind of leaders in our, in our companies. 
but I was really, really wrong about a lot of areas where we were spending money. And of course, I signed off on the logic of my audits and everything, but I was wrong. Like, there's no other way to say it. And, um, and I was wrong about some of my trajectory. I was wrong about a lot. Um, and that's okay. And I'm glad I did it now. I'm glad I did it before I tried to get into a bank loan, which was a line of credit or raise money because I went up really, really dumb. So I definitely think even if it's a friend of the family that's an accountant or somebody and will do us a favor, it, make it try to try to make it consistent and definitely do it pre financing. You don't have to. Now, talking about keeping the house in order, uh, tell us from your view, you know, some of the things you see that the entrepreneurs have wrong basically and that actually cost them money and time when they're coming come for investments and their legal house is not in order or their contracts are not in order. And what are the tips to get in order before? I think what uh, Hervé says is absolutely right. I mean, even bigger businesses that we're trying to invest in right now, not just the startup that is in, in bootstrapping mode, have that wrong. They, they focus so much on the product, they forget that they're building an institution to manage the product. So, for example, we're doing due diligence right now on a business that generates more than $10 million in revenue, and we cannot get this data run together. Like, it's, it's becoming such a challenge. So, like I said at the round table, you can do it during the investment process, and it will take you three months, but you will lose so much confidence and good faith that by the time you're sitting on around the, the boardroom table with your investors, they've already become impatient with you. They already have issues with you. So, don't lose that confidence. Just get it done before you knock on any investor door. Uh, because if I can't see all your employment contracts and all your supplier contracts and all your before, I, I, I just can't put money, I can't bet on you because you're not a good CEO fundamentally. It's not just about, I mean, because all of these contracts have tremendous risks, so you're not giving me that much comfort, but you being a good CEO, understanding how to build an institution is very important to us. Um, so some people think it's, you know, ticking boxes, it's just, you know, a due diligence checklist that I get, and it's just, you know, paperwork. It's not paperwork. It's about what kind of executive you are, how you're building your institution, how much work you've done to knock on my door and take my money, because we've done the same thing. We, as VCs, we do, the, we do the same thing to go take other institutions' money and, and deploy it. So I expect you to respect the process as much as I am putting it into, into this process. Uh, any questions from the floor? Uh, if you haven't made it, just sit with an entrepreneur, Stephanie. Hi. So um, I was wondering um, about there's obviously still a chasm between, um, although it's shrinking, between the people in this room and the average uh, person living in the region. And um, something that I uh, moved away, I still hear from 3D Mina. No? Uh, so he does 3D printing, so he does 3D printing. Um, and something that Roland brought up that I wanted to build on is, uh, I think it's relevant beyond just sort of like the tech industry, um, is how do you sell something that people don't know about? How do you solve things when they don't know about? Anyone? Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you sell something that people don't know about? Well, uh, as I said, I think uh, people didn't know about the deals when we started. And, um, you know, we had to convince people that uh, this was something that was going to be uh, powerful and effective for them. So, you know, I sat in front of as many people as I could. My partner sat in front of as many people as we could. And we, you know, you've got to, you have to have the drop meet going. Um, the other thing is, you know, come up with some use cases that, that other people could story tell around. Uh, so, you know, the first thing we did was we asked people to send in photographs of them, you know, enjoying the experience. Ronald was the first one there. Someone who came after you didn't have that problem of educating marketing because you did the job. But but are you like where, 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 how can this money invest that your customers become loyal to you and not for you the second thing, right? So any first movers in the room, any comp startups who believe they are the first movers in a particular area, raise your hands. Can you tell us first what you do and how if you have that dilemma and what you're trying to do to, to, to work around it? Uh, Ikitar is uh, uh, 
first are leading Arabic Hebrew marketplace. We are leading in the first read aloud Arabic ebooks, which is the story tells itself. So you see, you know the words and you hear it, and if you press the words, you can hear it. And what we did um, is a real time video. We took a child that doesn't know how to read, you know, two and a half, uh, three years old, and we video it how he interacts with the, uh, uh, with the story and put it on Facebook. And uh, in the first month we had 1,500 downloads for the same story. But I think, I guess, that the, uh, again, the question to you and also to Sahrab is, I think what you want to do as a first mover advantage, you want that industry to be synonymous with your own brand. You want daily deals to be gone out in the Middle East. You don't want daily deals to be group on because that's, you know, that's someone else and they will come after you. So how can you educate the market about e-books but have e-books in Middle East equal e you know, And what did, were you able, do you think you were able to do that? Well, you know, the second day we just launched the uh, uh, iOS uh, application. We had articles that e app is competing iBooks app. Just you know, the second day we just launched it because we went with the top-notch technology that equals uh, Apple Okay. I think it's a good point he's making. It's PR as well. I mean, you really have to tell your story. I mean, you want to be a thought leader. Yeah. So yeah, I think thought leadership. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's about traction because once you saw it, and if you start from here, knowing that someone else is going to follow, you're paving the way. So you make it get easier for the one who's following, but you need to keep it up. So good customer service, traction, keep the money to love and not getting tired and just like, lose it or just thinking that you just reached your final destination. I think it's the only way out because there are a lot of variables and keeping up the good work is the only way and traction. Yeah. It also reminds me of, of my previous startup with the Emily. When we first started, we wanted to create a really a big story and, and a lot of brand affiliation that when actually Google and Microsoft followed us uh, you know, six months or a year after us, people didn't really notice them, although they're Google and Microsoft. But because of the stories, because of like, the customer service, although we don't, we're not selling anything, but any feedback and email we get would like, email them, be very nice. And I think that thing, that brand affiliation, that, that sense of uh, and we played a lot on the Arabs, like oh, we're Arabs and Google and Microsoft are international and we're from the region, etc. So I think the emotions are uh, is an underestimated tool, you know, and startups need to use that. So it's not about just emotions for, you know, like I'm a victim or I'm a small guy. No, it's emotions. How can you move emotions with people? So flowers moves emotions. Emotions move. Customers want, and customers, loyal customers, he put a hundred other customers because his family and friend would be that. So how can you do that at scale, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to be, if you want to, sorry, if you want to own a bird, you have to be ubiquitous. So like what could be really interesting for you would be to have in your page or in your community five or six other options, and then literally have the people voting, like he can or whatever, right? Make them, force them to get bought into that. And that's why I actually advise you to change the name in yeah. Because if you want to move emotions, you can't use something that people use anyway. Well, in fact, uh, it's in, in that way also. But we, after the eight months, we are seeing that we're also building an e-commerce community, not just for buying e-books. So if I, you know, make it just for e-books, okay, like an Amazon, Amazon, you know, Amazon, but they sell almost everything. I had a peak. Uh, at the, the BT pricing plan. And one thing I noticed was that they were going to cap you. So if you use the gig, for every moment of bandwidth you spend after that, they were going to charge you. So we went to market saying that we have no cap. We went in unlimited. And I can't tell you what an impact that made because when BT launched, even though they had a huge marketing budget, the fact that we launched you know, with an uncapped limit you know, their marketing dollars, you know, just you know, helped us. Because suddenly people said, hey, these guys have been doing it, you know, sort of uncapped. So even with a fraction of the budget, we made a lot more noise just by a simple tweet.
Any questions on the floor anymore? Anyone else want to, want to, add, to add to that? I'd like to add something. This from general students uh, in the building. The teams that I met today, they're at a size where they haven't considered yet having a custom service as part of the team. And they haven't considered yet having a finance person as part of the team. So here, these are key areas that can, can uh, the custom facing side, including the out and the investment facing side, of course, sit with some Atlanta can't pull you down. I think it's important to get that in order to get that in the head that when you even when you're going through a seat down, start thinking of that team being more complete. It's not just about engineers and sales. It's all about it's all about customer service and it's about an in-house order and, and, uh, and governance early on. Mm -hmm. and I think if you're gonna go for the track of multiple lines of investments, this is something you need to get used to and comfortable with straight straight like that. And if you're gonna go for finance early, make sure there's enough to cover those areas. It's not just it's just you, CEO, and your partner, trying to do all those roles that you follow. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, my, my own personal view is a finance guy is needs you have to hire someone who's good at that. But customer service and sales, I think every key employee needs to do that at all times. It's part of the DNA. Part of it, my view is part of the DNA, you need to obsess about the customers. Yes, we need a customer service because he will decide to do the Xbox. But if it's not ingrained in the DNA that we need to obsess about the customer, whatever the customer is, or that we need to always keep on selling, like no individual in the company needs to have, has to have idle cycles. Each idle cycle should be used on selling, and, and customer service is in the DNA. That's my personal view and how I think each startup should do. And the finance guy needs a more rigorous approach. And yes, sometimes it's not natural within the, the emerging entrepreneurs, but that's something that's very important and needs to be hired for. Again, if you don't have it, then hire for it. I think one last uh, general comment uh, away from these details uh, about what was different about Amman this year than the year before and the year before. I think we're seeing the big regional companies, um, <coughs> powerhouses like like Adamex, like, uh, like Zane, like, are very interested in, in the space that you all work in right now. I think that's a good development, it's good news. They're engaged, they want to work with entrepreneurs, they want to invest in this space. Which means it's we have a higher potential to unlock a lot of value alongside these big players uh, because they're they're finding that the startups are solving problems that they might not be interested in solving or that they, they that they can layer on top of their infrastructure uh, a lot of uh, value propositions. So I think that's exciting, and the startups need to tap into it. Abuse it. And absolutely. Engage it because. Ask. Ask. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're, they're opening their doors, they're even unlocking dollars. So um, it's an exciting development, and I think we'll see more of it. Great. So on that note, yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry. I don't think I need the mic, but yeah. uh, we came late. What? We <laughs> came late. We came late. Uh, many reasons? Oh, he was traveling from a different country. Okay. Oh, from a different country, okay. There were, uh, you know, lots of entrepreneurs that were late this morning. And I just wanted to know why, uh, because you know, we were all here, and the event was supposed to start at a certain time. And you know, you know, we we're not here to like you know hang out with each other. We came here to help entrepreneurs and to you know listen to you and stuff. But, um, you know, I remember when I was you know, 21, I had started a sandwich bar, and I went to see my my accountant. I was 10 minutes late, and he ripped me apart for being 10 minutes late. And it was a great lesson. I because, you know, I realized that no matter how hard I'm working, the fact that when someone else is giving up the time, I, you know, owe it to them to show respect by, you know, being on time as well. So, anyway. I think, I, I think, I think it's a very important point. <laughs> I, I was late. I was late. I got lost. To the <laughs> I thought that was to you. <laughs> No, I think it's very important, and I think uh, I think that goes to say that, that that entrepreneurs are getting a lot of support, and, and we need to make sure that we don't drink the Kool Aid. We know that it's very hard; it's very tough to be an entrepreneur. And then when we get help, we actually you know deserve that. Help. So on that note, uh, first I want again I want to thank you again all for showing up today. Uh, do reach out to us if you need to get your stories published on Monda. You have Rem, raise your hand. Maya, Aline, and Stephanie Taylor, uh, who from the content team who can help you with that. 
if you need to talk to Rwanda for funding, you can have our email or on the site, and anything else we need to. Thank you again, and thank you for our members. <laughs>